Welcome back to the last example for chapter seven, where we have a, another mass pushed into a spring uh, so that we can see what that term looks like. So we have the question, the words and the picture from the slides. So we've been training ourselves and we'll continue to do this to draw the picture and indicate before and after in that picture so that we know how to ask and answer the questions involved. All right, so we're gonna make our standard table that keeps track of all the information for us, makes it so that we are organized and we can see how each one of these problems is slightly different from each other, but uses the same process. We have all of these different terms to ask ourselves about. All right. And so we will start with the whole before column. So at the beginning of the process, we have already pushed this mass into the spring. And so we are waiting to release it. It is not moving. In the before part of the problem, we are at the top of the ramp. So we have a yes to this MGH. In the before part of the problem, there is definitely a spring. Here it is drawn, and so we have that term as well, 1 half kx squared. In the after part of the problem, we are told specifically that we have stopped moving, so we do not have kinetic energy. We are at the bottom of the ramp, so we do not have any potential energy from gravity. We're lower down than we were in other places, and there's no spring here, and so we have a zero as well. Even before we get to the work term, and even if we don't remember all the words in the problem, the fact that we have lost all of our energy at the end of the problem means there definitely must be a work term that is taking all of that energy away. And that energy is being taken by friction. So yes, and it's because of the friction force, because of friction. Work and friction are not the same thing. We absolutely cannot just use the nine as the work term. And so we're going to draw it out here that work is the force in the direction of motion. And I'm not even going to have my extra caveat about how it's really not useful to use the FD cosine theta um, idea because we do not want to use that 20 degrees in the work term times the distance. All right, so the force in the direction of motion here is negative nine newtons. Negative because it's friction that comes from 180 degrees between the force vector and the displacement vector times the unknown distance. That is our thing we're solving for, so it's fine that we don't know what it is. All right. So we have our standard setup, energy before plus work added equals energy after. So we'll write that out. The more often we write this, the more confident we'll be at test time. All right, so the energy before column, if we look at it, has 0 plus mgh plus 1 half kx squared. The work added term was a yes, so we will um, put in negative 9 times d, just because we've already done that um, step. And then the energy after column is 0 plus 0 plus 0. All right, now. Pretty much all of the physics at this point is complete here, but there are a couple of things that we want to recognize about um, the trick involved with the math here. So we can plug in everything that we have, and we're going to recognize something probably fairly quickly. I'm just going to use black in this case. So the mass here is 2 kilograms, so 2 times 9.8 and we do not have the height of the ramp, plus 1 half times k is given to us, 3,300, times x. We need to remember that x, although we're told it's 10 centimeters, 
we need to be putting that into meters. And so we get 0 0.10 meters. And that's squared. And then minus 9 times d equals 0. We see that there are two separate unknowns. And so in that case, we think to ourselves, all right, what are we missing about what these two unknowns are? Because we don't give unsolvable problems. If we look at the triangle, and I'm going to draw a, I'm going to scroll down so I have room to draw a separate triangle. If we look at the triangle of the ramp itself, let's put it over here. The value of H is this side of the triangle. It is the vertical distance between where we started and where we ended. But the value, the idea behind distance is the distance along which we are actually moving and experiencing friction, which is the length of the hypotenuse here. So in this particular problem, the 20 degrees is used, not at all in the work term itself, but to have a relationship between D, the distance, and H, the height. If we think about our standard triangle, this distance H here is the hypotenuse, which we have labeled D, times the sine of 20 degrees. We can use the triangle that is drawn on our equation sheets to ensure that we actually recognize that fact. So now, and I'm going to circle it in blue, one extra color. Um, now we can go back and plug that in here. So we have 19.6 times, instead of H, we have D times the sine of 20 degrees. And then I can go ahead and put this part here into my calculator. So I get 16.5. And then this term is minus 9 times D, and that equals 0. All right, so we can simplify this. We have stuff attached to the D in this term and stuff attached to the distance in this term. And so 19.6 times the sine of 20 degrees is 6.7 times the distance d, plus 16.5 minus 9 times the distance d. These two can now be combined in the same way that 2x plus 3x would equal 5x, and they combine to be minus 2.3 times the distance. Negative 2.3 d plus 16.5 equals 0. So we can add this term to both sides. So now we have 16.5 equals 2.3 times the distance. And that way we can solve for it by dividing both sides by 2.3. And we get that the distance is equal to 7.2 meters. So this might be a long angled pathway that this thing is sliding along. And it had enough energy from all um, of the gravity potential energy and all of the spring potential energy that even though friction is slowly stealing energy, it still gets pretty far before it stops moving. So in this problem, the only significant complication that we have not seen in other examples comes from this step right here. Once we decide here in this step, and I'm going to make a box around it, that we have two unknowns, even if you stop here, you've done most of the work of the problem. You've identified what terms are involved, and you've plugged in the numbers that you know you have, and that is a lot of partial credit if at test time you forget about this trick then to do next. But it is worth recognizing that we have been dealing with triangles since chapter 3, and all of that stuff is on our equation sheet, and so we want to be willing and ready to use it when necessary. This is the last full example from chapter 7. We do still have more ideas in the power section of the 
um, slides and lecture, but they're all smaller problems that are on the slides themselves that I discuss um, and go through. So um, we will see you in those lecture videos and then beyond. Thanks for listening.